uh, there. And for uh, this first um, uh, presenter, we are really glad to have the CTO of uh, Money Hub, right? So Dave, uh, can you can you join the stage, Dave, uh, who will talk um, to us about open finance? Yeah, is it happening? Yes, it's already happening. Uh, so it's not it's not coming. It's not in the future. It's it's there. Hello, Dave. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks. How are you? <laughs> Doing really well. I invite you to share your screen and share what you have uh, with our attendees. Thank you. Perfect. Really slide. Perfect. We hear you well. I leave you for 25 minutes. Thank you. OK, perfect. Um, yeah, so it's uh, great, great to be here. I've attended API days um, as, as an attendee before, um, you know, and it, it's good to be back here presenting today. So. Um, today, we're going to talk about open finance, and yes, while we've got a long way to go, it is it is already happening. So, just kind of going through just a, a quick bit of context. Um, so, yeah, as many said, I'm, I'm CTO at Money Hub, um, but I've been involved in open standards uh, in, in kind of the financial services space for, for a while now. So, um, I'm a co-chair of the financial. Um, Great API working group at the OpenID Foundation, and um, kind of in, involved in various initiatives at, at I, ISO as well, and, and the IETF. Um, and so, you know, re really been on this journey uh, to open finance and open banking uh, for for a bit now. Um, and Money Hub, just in case um, you're not familiar with us, we are um, a fintech um, established in the UK for quite a while now. Uh, so we have what we call an intelligent financial assistant. Um, where we help people make better use of their money, understand it better, um, etc. And as part of that work, though, really, you know, we were a founding member of FData, which is a financial data and technology association, um, and really kind of pushing forward for this uh, this open finance um, and open banking. Uh, so yeah, we were one of the, the first sort of registered um, account information service providers. Um, we're also a payment initiation service provider as well. So doing both read and write uh, via, via APIs. So let's just talk a little bit about open banking, um, first of all, um, and then going to go into to open finance and, uh, and why that, that is already here and uh, why, why there's still a, <laughs> a bit of a long way to go as well. Um, so, you know, one, one of the things I have to say, and, you know, for, for those involved in kind of the API um, industry, you know, is a bit of a dirty word, but I, I have to say, you know, I've, I've been a reluctant screen scraper <laughs> since 2013. So uh, just for the context, for those who, who aren't familiar, um, screen scraping is where essentially, um, you know, as, as, a, as an end user, you might be able to log into your online banking or log into a platform to view your pension, um, and if those financial service companies don't provide APIs, um, actually one of the ways in which, um, you know, to, to get that data with the permission of the end user is to actually scrape that web page or scrape that mobile app. Um, and, and that is something that we've been doing because that's been the only way of getting the data. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, financial services in some areas was, was you know, um, especially a few decades ago, was really ahead of the curve technology wise. When it's come to APIs, unfortunately, it's taken a bit of um, legislative pushing um, to kind of move the industry forward. Um, but yeah, you know, but right, way back in 2013, uh, also um, European Commission started preparing the draft of, of PSD2. Um, and so, you know, that that's, you know, that, that sort of legislative push kind of started back then. Obviously, these things take time. In, in the UK, we had a, a Fingleton report into open data, and which really recommended um, sort of open banking. Um, there was an open banking working group formed um, a, out of that. Um, but, but really then it was uh, the CMA in the UK, the Competitions and Market Authority, that um, kind of added uh, an extra legislative push to open banking um, above PSD2 in the UK. Um, and so, we, um, uh, you know, and, and one of the key things there is that the CMA required there to be um, common standards for APIs for the top nine banks in the UK. Um, and just a bit of context here, you know, again, uh, you know, talking about open banking, um, but you may have heard FAPI mentioned a few different times. So, so FAPI is, you know, financial grade API standard. And it, it was originally just for financial APIs, but actually, um, you know, 
can be used well, well beyond kind of the area of financial services. And so Nat Sakamura, who who is the chairman of the OpenID Foundation, he's also been reluctantly screen scraping in, in Japan for quite a while. Um, and, you know, uh, with all this sort of legislative changes, we, we formed this working group to really try and, um, yeah, get, get some standards um, for APIs in this space. Um, and yeah, you know, just going forward, uh, FAPI was was adopted by um, the UK Open Banking Implementation Entity um, as their security profile. And I'll talk a little bit more about, about um, you know, where else FAPI has been used um, a bit later. Um, but open finance. So, you know, open banking, um, you're probably all familiar with it and actually Although it's not all APIs, there is still some um, what people call screen scraping plus in there. Uh, th there's a lot of APIs. There's a lot of movement there. But but this this talk is about open finance, um, and so I'm just showing you a bit of a slide from something that we do at Money Hub, and we're not alone in the industry in doing this um, either. But just in different ways in which essentially we we get the data into our proposition, um, and. You know, at the end of the day, you know, software is about solving problems for for users, and users don't really care about API or screen scraping or whatever. They they you know there's a there's a problem uh, in the sense that you know people often have multiple accounts all in one place. It's hard to get a kind of overall picture of their finances um, and to then make informed decisions. You know, based on that information. And so with MoneyHub, we uh, yeah we get we screen scrape data, um, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we also get intermediated data. So in the pensions and investment world, uh, there are actually kind of APIs. Um, some of them are still, uh, I, I might make some people shudder, but some of them are still SOAP based. Um, you know, so there's lots of whistles flying around and so kind of legacy, um, you know, approaches, but they are APIs essentially um, to, to get some, you know, investment and pension data. Uh, some of them only with permission of a financial advisor. Um, we also get, you know, other data in, for example, um, we, we get property valuations in, you know, from the likes of Zoopla or Rightmove. Um, so we, we also partner with particular enterprises um, and get bespoke data feeds in, um, you know. So there's a lot of different ways of getting the data in, um, which is not just kind of a published open banking API. Um, now, obviously, you know, where there is a bit of fragmentation, you know, that's not great for innovation, um, you know, and, and some of these are, are quite time consuming. But, you know, just because there isn't, um, you know, some legislative mandate for, you know, all financial service providers to, to, you know, to have an API, that doesn't mean that open finance isn't here and companies like Money Hub are getting the data uh, from these various different sources. Um, and, you know, as, as well as kind of what's happening already on the ground um, with, uh, you know, whether, whether it's getting the data via screen scraping or bespoke connections, um, there, there's quite a lot of initiatives happening at the moment. I've just picked out um, a few just to mention. So uh, the, the Berlin Group, which, you know, they, they publish um, their next gen PST2 standard. So uh, kind of a, a standard for um, for open banking, kind of, which is is fairly widely adopted um, across many um, European countries, uh, not, not the UK though, um, but they recently announced that they're also moving into open finance. And so, you know, they're, they're, uh, there's, there's not a, any legislative mandate for banks or financial services companies to use their standards, but rather they're an industry, um, you know, consortium. And so actually their members are really, you know, pushing for open finance to move forward. Um, in the UK, there is, um, you know, a pension dashboard project, which, you know, has been uh, on the cards for a long time, uh, but it is moving forward. And one of the uh, decisions that has been made there is that rather than there just be one single dashboard, which is a case I understand in, in some, um, some, you know, some countries, they only have sort of one kind of government provided dashboard. Um, in the UK, the decision has been made that there will be essentially multiple dashboards, multiple dashboard providers. And what that means is there will be multiple companies who will be able to have access to pension data. 
in the UK. And obviously, that's all going to be regulated and, and uh, you know, it's all permissioned access, um, etc. But, you know, they're, they're, the wheels are sort of slowly in motion um, on that. Uh, and there, there will be a legislative basis for that. Um, as well as that, though, there uh, is an initiative in the UK um, led by um, Tizer called Open Savings and Investment. And so uh, th this is where, you know, there's a, a group of um, sort of data providers and data consumers. So on the provider side, um, you know, some in investment um, managers, you know, uh, the likes of Fidelity and Hargreaves, um, et cetera, um, who are looking to, you know, group together um, and, you know, provide access to uh, savings and investment data. Um, and so that work is is underway, um, you know, standards are being developed for that, um, you know, and, and, and the model is being looked at uh, around consent. And there's also, you know, various initiatives with, with smart data um, and, you know, the whole background of uh, GDPR um, in the sense that, you know, uh, you know, consumers in, 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 uh, in, in the Europe ha have the right to, you know, access their data and to, for data portability and to access their data, you know, in, in a machine readable uh, format. So there, there, there are many different ways of getting open finance data and there are kind of extra initiatives um, happening uh, at the moment. So I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about FAPI because this is, you know, although, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of on the business track and we're talking about, um, you know, open finance and, and, and sort of what it is kind of getting this data um, about people's finances uh, from all these different sources. Um, it is important sometimes to, to look at the, the technical aspect. And so, you know, FAPI is, is, you know, as I mentioned before, is a financial grade API and it's a, um, you know, it, it's a good grouping of um, experts, really, who are, you know, working on creating these interoperable standards. And so it's already, you know, one of the benefits of, um, you know, being part of the OpenID Foundation is that, you know, it's an international standards body. So, you know, the problems that, you know, we're solving in the UK or are being solved in, you know, Europe or across PSD2 are not unique to the UK and, 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 and um, you know, in the rest of Europe. A actually, the, the same problems are being experienced in the States, um, you know, in Japan. And there, there are really, you know, through FAPI, it's quite interesting seeing what, what is happening kind of globally. So uh, there's the CDR initiative in Australia, um, which again is, is, is wider than just banking. Um, you know, it's about consumer data rights. Uh, there is, you know, in, in the States and in Canada, there's a financial data exchange, which doesn't have a legislative backing, but again, is an industry grouping of, um, you know, both, both on the data provider side, banks and financial institutions, uh, and on the consumer side in terms of cloud accounting packages, you know, personal finance managers, uh, to, to kind of create these interoperable standards. Um, and yeah, FAPI is, is trying to help facilitate, um, you know, some of this to, to really, you know, the, the analogy that um, uh, Gavin Littlejohn, who's, you know, the, the chairman of, of FData um, uses is that of, of railway tracks and the, the different, um, you know, railway gorges of the different tracks that if the, um, if the tracks, you know, have different uh, dimensions and the trains can't flow between the different tracks, and you know, left that this sort of standardization doesn't just happen, uh, but it is really important, um, you know, for for innovation really. And yeah, so just just talking about that really for uh, for a little bit um, when, when it comes to 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 you know FAPI and and open finance really, um, you know, standardization really is is the unsung hero because kind of as I mentioned, companies like Money Hub, we're already getting the data. So we can we can screen scrape, you know, various different pensions, investment providers, consumers are manually adding their data where needed. You know, there's also kind of OCR options around that. You know, people are exploring, you know, GDPR based ways of, of accessing the data. So, you know, it's already possible, um, you know, to, to build propositions where you can access 
um, you know, whole world of open finance data. And in fact, that's something that as Money Hub, we we not only provide our own proposition, but you know, we provide an API platform um, that quite a few sort of fintechs and, and larger companies build on top of our um, our prop, uh, you know our platform. So you know, open finance is here in that way, but standardization really unlocks well it unlocks innovation but also it, it brings security now a lot of people complain about um screen scraping you know the security Im implications of it um you know the, the reality is that that actually that that's mainly been overblown and yes while from a you know i'm the first person to say i, I would very much prefer not to screen scrape um you know and, and to rather go via secure apis uh, you know, actually, there has there's been you know very little, um, if any, evidence of of any security issues with with screen scraping. But it does slow down innovation, um, and so standards like like FAPI can really help open finance bloom. Um, and you know, <laughs> just jumping to my my third point there, really, um, when it comes to APIs, you know, and you know, on, on the tech track here, you know, I'm sure there's there's lots of discussion around, you know, creating APIs and the different techniques and the different tools which can be used for that. You know, my 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 personal opinion is that on on the data side of an API. So, if we take for example, you know, getting access to to a pension, how that pension is represented in data, you know, how you represent. The balance, how you represent contributions. To me, that is by far the easiest part. Um, and yet, ideally, there would be standardization there. But if there's not, it's not the end of the world. Because, you know, from a technical point of view, you know, if, if company A, you know, calls their, their balance field, you know, <laughs> um, settled balance, and company B calls it, you know, available balance, um, you know, that, that those sort of things are, uh, you know, standardization doesn't matter so much there. Yeah, it would be great actually if it, if it, if they were all using the same schema, but it, it's it's kind of you know that that's that's a much easier problem to to go over. What is far harder is um, auth authentication, authorization, and you know consent. Authorization and consent um, often get kind of uh, you know used together. So. So yeah, that that's and that's really what we're trying to do with FAPI. We're not trying to standardize authentication necessarily, but we are trying to standardize the you know authorization protocol because at the end of the day, um, you know we we are very much in a place where we you know believe in in that user permissioned access to data. So that means you know users need to consent to sharing their data, whether it's pension data, banking data mortgage data, loan data, health data. It's up for the user to consent and authorize access to that data. And it's that bit where, you know, things can very easily get very complicated um, in how a company like Money Hub um, interacts with, you know, whether it's a, a Barclays Bank or it's a, you know, Fidelity or it's a, um, standard life you know the different kind of providers of of this financial data that is where it, it gets a lot harder and so what we're trying to do with FAPI is actually provide kind of a, a bit of a blueprint on look this is how you can do it and actually the actual kind of you know authentication you know whether that's um you know there are other initiatives to try and standardize that you know and i would encourage people to, to look at fido um and and you know all, all, all that's happening there but, but they, this interaction between these different um, parties and how consent works is, is really important to get right um, to unlock um, innovation, really. Um, and, and then the middle one I've got there around conformance. Um, and this, again, is, is just a, it, it sounds really boring, but if, if you have some API standards and you have some standards for open finance, if you don't have some tests to test that, that everyone conforms to the same standard, then they won't because we're all human, we all kind of read things slightly differently. And so you really need some technical tests to ensure conformance. And so that, you know, that that's really, um, you know, <laughs> in conclusion, open finance is here, we're getting the data um, already, but there's still a long way to go. And 
Uh, you know, my hope is that, you know, through the existing initiatives, pension dashboard project, open savings and investments, um, you know, that that already we're moving in, in the right direction. Hopefully um, there'll be more initiatives. We don't need to wait for legislation. We can look at what's happening in the States and Canada with financial data exchange. So it's all it's all happening. Um, and, and my hope is, though, that, that we don't end up with an incredibly fragmented ecosystem. Um, but, but rather, you know, we try and follow open standards where they're available, which, um, yeah, will we'll just help uh, with for both innovation um, and security. So, yeah, there, there we go. Um, I think we've got, you know, a good good few minutes for, for any questions, which I'd be happy to take. Yes, can you uh, un, um, unshare your screen? Uh, so we, uh, it's better for the questions. So we have a few questions, actually. Uh, I, will take the, I will take this one. What is the impact of PSD2? SCA on FAPI, right? PSD2 slash NCA on FAPI, uh, if at all, right? Uh, uh, right. Um, yeah. So okay. There. Just quickly. Um, the, the 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 background to this is yeah, strong customer authentication in PSD2, and you know, part of the the, the ERP the working group identified three different m models in which that strong customer authentication sort of can happen. Uh, between uh, you know the bank and, and the fintech, and, and those three are redirect, decoupled, and embedded. So redirect is how FAPI works out of the back. So that 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 is just standard, and that just means you get redirected to authenticate, and so that can work fine. Um, decoupled, actually, we've worked on a um, on a, an API st uh, standard called CBA, Client Initiated Back Channel Authentication which can support decoupled in a standards compliant way and in a secure way. Um, and so the only one that then is embedded. Um, and and that, that is essentially, you know, the main problem with screen scraping is not that you're, you're reading HTML. The main problem is that the user's credentials are being, um, you know, which they should only be with that bank, are being used with, you know, a FinTech or, you know, that data consumer. And embedded has that same problem. So embedded we don't support in FAPI. But most banks are trying to move away from having to support embedded anyway. We have a question, uh, so two questions about security. Maybe just the first one, easy to answer. What solution for identity provider, single sign-on? Uh, and so do you implement that money hub? Um, if you so, we, <laughs> so yeah, we, we, we use OpenID Connect um, internally, and we, we, use, we use some open source libraries um, to power that, so rather than a commercial solution. The nice thing just with OpenID Foundation is that um, people can get certified, and it's not like an expensive thing. Um, there's these technical tests, and so we use um, open source libraries that are certified to the OpenID Connect standard. Yes, I don't. I didn't expect less from you to use open source uh, <laughs> technologies, right? And not a vendor. What checks are in place to actually dissuade or block bad actors using APIs accessing consumer data? Just an example: uh, Can a consumer would be able at some point to turn off API access as an option within their account profile with the provider? You know, or what are what what's in place actually to to secure all this? Yeah. So look, we, we in, in in the world of PSD two, you know, you have um, to to get access to APIs. You have to be re regulated. So it's a regulated activity. And so you know, in the UK, it's the Financial Conduct Authority regulates you. So that, that's actually a, a pretty high bar of, of protection. Um, and across kind of open finance, it, it's interesting. We're hoping that you know you don't have to have ten different authorizations for access to different data. Hopefully, we we can reuse some of that. That the same one. Um, but again, I think this gets a little bit, you know, um, you know, e even, you know, Google and Facebook who have much more open sort of API ecosystems, you know, they, they, there's things you can put in place to protect access, you know, so for example, you know, there's Google have put a lot of things in place um, to prevent bad actors. So I think it's, 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 um, it's, it's not as big a problem as people make it out to be. Yeah, just an example, at least during the COVID-19 crisis in France, uh, the government asked for Google and Apple to open API without the consent of user, right, uh, from the mobile, you know, from the, uh, the mobile operating system. And actually, Google and Facebook kind of refused to say, no, look, we need to ask the user consent. The user has to be aware, and they added in this option that enables you to know when the API is open or not, right? You know, so that's, uh, that's what would be done for finance. Last question here. Uh, uh, COVID-19 has exposed the fragility of digital identity across e-commerce, banking, and other sectors. Uh, this only increases also, fine, this also increases crime and fraud. Who needs to get together on this, on this issue? Do we need a standard? Do we need industry? Do we need market? Do we wait? <laughs> 
through your mind, right? Yeah, we need we need we need it all, and there are initiatives. You know, I mean, the European Commission announced that like this is going to be a big big thing that they're they're looking at. Like the UK, it's it's a real problem at the moment, and you know pe people are, are looking at it. The hope is that potentially in the UK, for example, with bank identities. So you know, actually, you know, one of the things that we were able to push um, from a standards perspective in the UK is that banks, the top nine banks, have to support what's called app to app flows. Um, so that means if you're already authenticated on your app, you can just be redirected from one app to another, and you don't have to like re-sign in from the beginning. And this is actually like really secure because. If you're onboarded into an app, you know you can store private keys there. You know it it it, it has a lot of good security, uh, you know, uh, pluses around it. So the hope is that we can actually use those bank logins to power some digital identity. It doesn't meet all the requirements, you know, of, of some identity verification, but actually in the UK at least, it's it's a lot better than most other digital identity solutions that we have. So uh, there is work underway to try and better utilize that. Yeah, thank you very much, Dave, for answering all these questions. Just to say, we have some cat lovers in the chat who who wants absolutely to see the cat. Or at least know <laughs> her name, right? <laughs> and, uh, and maybe the cat is hungry as much as I am right now, right? Yeah. So, I think. <laughs> so, so cat lovers are supporting you. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Dave. Uh, right, thank fine. you for all of this. I invite you to unshare your screen, and so we can have our next speaker. Uh,